Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Chris, covered alcoholic. Chris. We're going to... Uh, we didn't get the questions last hour, but we will this hour, I can promise you. We're going to a little tie up here, and then we're going to uh, uh, do two and three right before lunch. We'll, we'll get some questions and answers. I know we want to do that. Some of you guys got me at, at the break. Y'all always ask the greatest questions at break. And then you just get goofy in here when we ask them from the podium. I don't know what that's about, but, uh, but we'll see. I wanted to... Um, Add a couple of things to what Charlie and Katie were just talking about. If, if you guys want to mark a page in the book today, there's lots of pages we're going to go to and you guys are marking. And again, in those little red books, anytime we're talking to the doctor's opinion, the numbers don't jive. But the regular numbers, will, will 1 through 164, will, will, will jive up for the, for the uh, anonymous press books. But uh, any pages in there you want to mark, make sure you mark page 24. Okay, guys, it's the place on the book. 23, uh, Charlie just read it, page, top of page 24, it talks about that we'll have lost the power to choose whether we're going to drink or not. And I got, if there's a secret handshake in AA, it's this page. This is the page that's, you know, in, in 1987, I tried to commit suicide because I believed that I was worthless and just couldn't get sober. And, and, and somebody explained to me that this is a form of mental insanity. The very next day, they showed me this page. I don't have a choice to drink. Most of our fellowship believe that we have a choice whether we're going to drink or not. Let me, let me get it clear with it, guys, because the guys that you sponsor, you need to make it clear with them. I have the choice whether I'm going to work a program, whether I'm going to enter a, a, a spiritual path and stay there. Does that make sense? I have a choice whether I'm going to go to meetings. I have a choice when you come up and ask me to sponsor whether I say yes or no. Are you with us? I make enough of those choices on the negative side, and I get cut off from the sunlight of the Spirit, and I get loaded. At that point, insanity returns, and my head says... You could smoke a joint. And <laughs> so if there's, a, if there's a page in there, though, that any of you guys, because I know we got a lot of long-term sobriety in here, and I know we have some young sobriety in here. And i got to tell you guys, hospitals all over the country today are teaching the fact that we have a choice whether we're going to drink. And i and I got to tell you, that's where it confuses the issue. A lot of people sitting in AA today, I guarantee you, I can take you to a meeting in my hometown today, tonight at 8 o'clock, and there'll be a guy that'll share five minutes before the meeting's over, because that's where he always does it. You with us? And he says, my name's so-and-so, and I got up this morning and chose not to drink. Oh, my God. <laughs> you with us? Again, if you can do that and make it stick, what are you coming around here for? Go have a nice life. It's a behavioral problem. Let me, let me explain something real quick, guys, because the jury's in on this genetic piece. The jury's in on this, this disease concept, this illness. Our bodies are wired different. And because I come from a hospital, we talk to patients a lot about this stuff. And 10 years ago, you might have could have argued it. Today, with PET scans and MRIs, we get to see how the brain reacts. The part of the brain that reacts is not this frontal lobe, not the, not the thinking part. You with me? It's friendship and stuff. I want to talk to you. I'm using the front part of my brain, you know, because we're buds. You follow? You pull out a gun, the bottom base primitive part of my brain lights up like a neon sign. Flight or fight. Y'all understand this? This is survival. That's where alcoholism lives, folks. We know this for an absolute fact. This is not something the way we're wired that we're going to be able to think through. The piece I want to say real quick before we move on. This thing is... Can y'all see what I did back here? This this, this is a little timeline of Christian... I want you all to all understand because some of you guys I think are, are, are a little, I know I was, as confused about the progression of this illness. Alcoholism and drug addiction is progressive, and it progresses in different people at different rates. You'll follow? Unfortunately, the big book makes it clear, a clear, clear piece that it travels uh, uh, faster in women than it does in men. It seems to be some st- statistical proof. You can look at Katie, and that pretty well proves that. <laughs> <laughs> More severe brain damage early on when you. When you're, no, bless your heart. You got to get them when you get them. You know what I'm saying? Not, I, but you can see, see, I was born in 1953, guys, and that's when my alcoholism. That's my father was an alcoholic. My twin brother and I caught the genetic bull in 1953. I didn't start drinking until I was about 17. We were laughing. Like, I was kind of a late bloomer, you know. Good gosh, you know. Hell, I didn't lose my. Never mind. <laughs> 
1971 is when I started drinking, okay? And, and so it, we, we see a lot of young people in these rooms whose disease has progressed at a very rapid rate, and they only have a few years before they're gone beyond recall. And this idea that you can get sober anytime you want is horse hockey. This is, this is not true because you can get to a spot the book talks about and we've proved it medically. At a certain point, our bodies and minds wear out and you're not going to get well. You're going to go to the state hospital and they're going to change your diapers on a daily basis. And it's just, I mean, in stage alcoholism is hor it's horrible to watch. I wish we knew, I mean, the, the little young people that come to the hospital where I work, the treatment center, and they come and say, well, you know, if I get as bad as that Chris Raymer, I'll quit, you know, and you know, I mean, I can, I can get down with that, you know? But the truth is, some of those young people, the diseases progress a lot further than my disease ever did. This is why I've got a real problem with people sitting in meetings talking about war stories endlessly because that's the stuff that separates the rooms. Our common problem and our common solution on page 17 is all the same. Everybody in here, we're exactly the same. I don't care if you're a woman or a man. The common problem is the same. The common solution is the same. It's only when we start telling the stupid stories that we start separating the rooms. Make sense? Feel pretty passionate about that, do you, Chris? Yeah, I sure do. <laughs> I think in a 12-step call we're going to talk about this afternoon, it's important to have a story. That's a good place to share that story. Friday night from the podium like we did last night, you better have a little story or you're going to empty your room. You better have something to say up there, you know. Tell, tell your story. But just sitting in an open discussion meeting telling how many DWIs you had again is, 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 is a wasted effort. I know you think you're helping somebody, but you're not. Because I can assure you there's a young man sitting in the back who's never had a single DWI and you just gave him his get out of Jail free card. Y'all understand? Okay. Just, just got to stay away. This progression of the illness, early on in my, my illness, perhaps I could have taken some of those prescription medications that the doctors want to prescribe so freely. As the disease continues to progress, even in my sobriety, I can't take those prescription medications like I used to be able to take. You, you follow? My body, the phenomenal craving that Katie was talking about, it was so susceptible as the disease progresses. Make sense? I think, I think, let me sum it up by saying this so I can get. My path gets narrower the older I get. As this disease progresses, that path gets narrower. So the medications that you were placed on when you left treatment that you're not having any trouble with now, two years from now, six months from now, you may not be able to take those without the craving kicking in. If you're taking a benzodiazepine, it's just a matter of time before you will drink again. The reason I'm saying this is we're watching thousands of people in the fellowship because we get to travel all over. And we're watching thousands of people in our fellowship relapse around prescription medication prescribed by doctors that should, by God, know better and don't. And I'm not knocking the doctors. It's the pharmaceutical companies are the problem, truly, because they all are interested in selling the, selling, the, selling the drugs. Largest prescription medication on the face of the earth right now is antidepressants, and I find that disturbing disturbing. I'm not knocking antidepressants. Didn't even begin to go there. I'm talking about the other medications are the ones that we're relapsing over. Most of the alcoholics that I'm watching today that are relapsing are relapsing through prescription medication. Most of the prescription addicts that I'm, I'm catching out there relapsing are relapsing around alcohol. That cross addiction piece is what's killing us. And anything that changes the way I feel, you got to hold suspect. So that's, that's the nature of that beast. Y'all are good with that? Did anybody hear me say, stop taking your medication? No. Anybody hear me? No, because I, I did not. Thank you. Here's Miss Katie. Oh, or Charlie. We'll do Charlie. I'm sorry. Here's Charlie. Charlie, alcoholic. Um, we just it just occurred to Chris and I that maybe we'll let Katie took the bulk of this hour. I don't know. I, you know, I don't know where that idea came to us, but uh, Katie. We're going to, we're going to roll into step two and three. And I love the way Katie does step three. So I don't want to step on much of that time, but, um, you know, there's places in the book where it says we, we hope we've made clear the difference between the alcoholic and the non-alcoholic, right? And that's what we were talking about in step one is what is the difference between the alcoholic and the non-alcoholic? This physical allergy, mental obsession thing that, that we, we just, pound into the new guy. I go out to this treatment center on my, uh, every Monday in Austin called Austin Recovery, and uh, the men's center, there's about 60 of them, 60 men in this thing, and I figure I get four shots at them 
And they're there for four Mondays, and I talk about the same thing every Monday. The nature of the disease of alcoholism and what we mean by step one, because I figure if they're there four times, maybe they'll hear it one time. You know, the first time they don't hear much. second time, maybe they'll start hearing it. By the third time, they're going, okay, you know, and then the fourth time, usually they're getting ready to go home and not listening to much anyway. But, but once we roll into step two, I usually don't spend a lot of time on step two with a new guy. I, uh, but you know, because I've said many times that, you know, when it talks about lack of power, let me see where I was in the book. It says, learning all this stuff, let's go to page 38. Learning all this stuff, uh, about physical allergy and mental obsession. And you know, when you get in a treatment center, even if I'm in a good treatment center and they're talking about physical allergy and mental obsession and what we mean by hopeless condition of mind and body. And you know, and now I understand why I drank. Okay. Thank God, you know, because I've never really understood. And all this, not all this, knowing all this stuff does squat to keep a guy like me sober. Understanding this stuff will not keep a guy like me sober. So, you know, that's what they're talking about on the bottom of 38. It says, some of you are thinking, yeah, what you tell us is true, but it doesn't fully apply. We admit we have some of these symptoms, but we have not gone to the extremes you fellows did, nor are we likely to. For we understand ourselves so well after what you've told us that such things cannot happen again. We've not lost everything in life through drinking, and we certainly do not intend to. Thanks for the information. <laughs> now, does that, I mean, you know, does that sound familiar? And he goes, that may be true of certain non-alcoholic people who, though drinking foolishly and heavily at the present time, are able to stop or moderate. And back on 20 and 21, it talks about the difference between the, the moderate drinker and the hard drinker and the real alcoholic. But then it says, but the actual or potential alcoholic, with hardly an exception, will be absolutely unable to stop drinking on the basis of self-knowledge. See if you think they think this is important. This is a point we wish to emphasize and re-emphasize, to smash home upon our alcoholic readers as it has been revealed to us out of bitter experience. It sounds like they think it's kind of important, you know, <laughs> it, that, that that I know that... that um, on the basis of self-knowledge, I got no shot. So when we talk about having this step one experience, I roll into that place where I go, my God, I think I got it just the way you're describing it. No wonder I couldn't st stay sober when I would make up my mind to stay sober because on my own power, I got no shot. I got absolutely no shot. And if you turn over the first page of We Agnostics, it says... We could wish to be moral. We could wish to be philosophically comforted. In fact, we could will these with things with all our might, but the needed power wasn't there. It uses the word power six times on this page. It says our human resources as marshaled by the will were not sufficient. They failed utterly. Lack of power. That was our dilemma. We had to find a power by which we could live, and it had to be a power greater than ourselves. Obviously. Why is that obvious? Because my power ain't going to get the job done. That's all I really got to know in step two. If I have smashed step one into a guy, we usually don't have to hang out in step two a long time because the most important thing a guy's got to know in step two is that my power ain't going to get the job done. On my own power, I got no shot. I got no shot. I mean, it's like stepping into the ring with Mike Tyson. I mean, I couldn't, I got no shot with a pocket knife. You know, I mean, you know, and it's the same thing against alcoholism. On my own power, I'm going to get drunk again. And judging by what we talked about, if you looked at me from 30,000 feet up in the air, you'd be able to tell within a few days when he's getting ready to get drunk again. He's getting restless, irritable, discontent. So when we roll, I think we can waste a lot of time in step two. And I'm not saying that a lot of us don't have significant problems with, with the whole God thing, you know, because it says in there about half of us do. It says about half of our fellowship were of this type. It also means about half of us weren't. You know, I mean, you know how we dance around God, you know, we, we, we do a real soft shoe around God where we're going, well, you know, it's a power greater than yourself, and you can call it anything you want. You can, I mean, you can make the power. And, and I do think that was brilliant. And that just came out of Abby. Have you ever been sponsoring somebody and you hear something come out of your mouth and you go, 
my God, that was brilliant. You know, I, mean, I don't know, where, I don't know where that came from. Well, that's what happened when Ebby was talking to Bill that day because you know we like to have heady arguments about spiritual stuff, and and a, a drunk can't always tell you what he believes in, but boy, I can tell you what I don't believe. You know, and you know, if there's a God, how can there be this? And why would He let this happen? And if there's, you know, and then Ebby knocked the wind out of Bill when he goes, "Why don't you choose your own conception of God?" I mean, Bill was like, he says, that statement floored me. You know what, Ebby said that. That wasn't part of the Oxford movement. That wasn't part of their belief. It just came out of Ebby because he didn't want to argue with Bill about God. He's like, pick whatever God you want, Bill. And Bill's like, geez, I, I don't have an argument for that. <laughs> you know, it says it, it melted away. You know, scales of prejudice fell from my eyes. It, it melted this icy mountaintop in whose shadow he had shivered for years. You know, where all of a sudden they're like, you pick whatever power you want. The main thing a guy's got to believe in step two is that his power ain't going to get the job done. That's why we talk about problem, solution. The solution is this power. And they, and they talk about it a lot. But I'm not going to be interested in that power if I still think my power is going to do something. But the moment that I surrender and realize that my power, there is a willingness that's strapped to that surrender that will carry me through the rest of the work. And, you know, so when we get into, you know, that if I really have a step one experience, um, the step, uh, that other thing is going to come. You know, and, and when it goes over here, it says on page, I believe it's 40. Seven. We needed to ask ourselves but one short question. Do I now believe, or am I even willing to believe, that there's a power greater than myself? Is it possible? And when I say about step two a lot of times is that if this side of the chalkboard was zero, meaning there is no God, period, right, nothing, and then the, the other side of the chalkboard was a 100, meaning total God consciousness, right, I mean, I hang out with God all day. We had breakfast this morning. You know, I mean, it's just, you know, just, you know, I used to think that I had to get all the way over to 100 to take step two. And all the book is saying is, is it possible that there might be something to the right of zero? That's all it takes. Is it possible that there could be a power that can take me beyond where I am today? And it says, on this simple cornerstone, a wonderfully effective spiritual structure can be built. It's, it makes it so, I mean, you talk about a broad road for us. I mean, I have to become convinced that my power's got no shot, and then I can, you know, roll with whatever power I have a limited belief of. And, uh, and then, you know, then we roll into, you know, and I like the way the circumstances under which we get to ask the second step proposition. On page 52, 53, when we became alcoholics, Crushed by a self-imposed crisis we could neither postpone nor evade, we had to fearlessly face the proposition that God's either everything or else he's nothing. God either is or he isn't. What was our choice to be? Time to choose, right? There's no door number three. But, you know, and it's funny. Then we get down, there's another part where it talks about the turning point. I love it. Because, you know, in in the how it works, it always talks about... Um, we stood at the turning point. We asked his protection and care with complete abandon. You know, did you ever ask yourself where the turning, what the turning point is? The turning point, if I can find it in my book, where is that, Katie? Huh? No, no, I'm talking about, there's a, here it is on page 25. If you're as seriously alcoholic as we were, we believe there's no middle of the road solution. We're in a position where life was become impossible, impossible. And if I'd passed into a region from which there's no return through human aid, we had but two alternatives. One was to go on to the bitter end, trying to block out the consciousness of my intolerable situation. And the other is to accept spiritual help. That's the turning point right there. There's no big road sign at the turning point, but if it says that if I'm, into this impossible situation, and I'm, I can't be fixed through human aid, my, my wife, my girlfriend, my probation officer, my sponsor, the meetings, none of that stuff. I've only got two choices. One was to go on to the bitter end, blocking out how crappy things are going to be, 
and the other is to accept spiritual help. Now, the reason I love Alcoholics Anonymous is we're the only people in the world that you give me that choice, and I go, damn. Can can you tell me a little more about that bitter end? You know, I mean, I mean, how bitter is it? You know, and, and, and how long is that going to take? You know, I mean, you know, because this whole accepting spiritual help goes against my nature because I'm used to running everything. Now, Katie's going to do step three, and she just does a beautiful job of it. So I'm going to, I'm going to shut up. But I, that's about as far as I go with step two working with most guys is if they're fully convinced that their power won't get it done, then it's time to start talking about this other power. All right, thanks. All right, now I got some time. (laughs) Um, uh, Katie, alcoholic. Um, You know, I'm, I'm in the same lineage where that second step, if if they're struggling with the second step, that means the first step has not been accepted, period. It's really that simple. And, yeah, we got people who have, you know, um, atheism, agnosticism. I, I don't know that I've really met the true atheist, but I have certainly met agnosticism. I myself have current agnosticism where I don't think God's going to take care of my kids. I don't think he's going to take care of Charlie's health, you know, those kind of things. And, and those are, are constant battles in sobriety that we work with. However, we're talking about taking this new guy through the work and it, it is with sufficient, um, knowledge on my part that I've done a great job at explaining what the problem is. Otherwise, you're, what, what ends up happening, what, what I see happens a lot, and this is my own experience, is that we want to get that four step done. Get that four step done. Everybody, you need to get that four step done. But if you don't understand the problem, you're trying to get self to fix self. And that is very, very dangerous. And so you've got to get to this problem that we're, we're I, I mean, I don't know about you guys, but when I walked into Alcoholics Anonymous and I read those 12 steps, my first reaction was, oh, no way. Absolutely not. I mean, does anybody ever walk in and go, oh, thank God. There, there's the answer I've been looking for. Wow. You know, and then of all things, spiritual help? Oh, no way. Mm-mm. No, and I remember I read them all and went, oh, I think I've checked off everything. Okay, whatever. But I did love the fellowship. I love the laughter. And I love, once again, you're my people. And uh, you're my people that I can appreciate when Charlie says, explain bitter end just a little bit more because I'm going to, I'm going to weigh this deal out. Uh, we, we are such con artists, aren't we? You know, I mean that the third step to me is, well, it just, it happens to be the root of our problem, right? And, and, and so many people, including myself, miss this crucial step and you miss it because you're, you're just, you're unaware of it. You're a victim of the delusion. Those, there's a lot of power in the word victim, and there's a lot of power in the word delusion. And so we're talking about, I am not even aware of what I'm doing. That's good sponsorship. Good sponsorship is not about worrying if I'm going to hurt your feelings. Good sponsorship is you've asked me to tell you what you don't want to hear. So sit down. Because I'm getting ready to tell you. And it's not going to be pretty. And I'm not going to. I always tell my sponsees, man, we're setting your feelings aside right now. Because I'm not going to sit here and, and, and patty-cate your feelings at all. As a matter of fact, you're so delusional, you're having a feeling based on a delusion. I mean, how crazy is that? You know, I love the first time I ever heard outright mental defect, full flight from reality, can't differentiate the truth from the false. I went, oh, I am home. (laughs) <laughs> this is good news, man. I mean, somebody is finally talking my language. So I finally am beginning to understand that I fit. Didn't you have that feeling when you came in here that you actually finally fit? And I'm with the people that get this. Now, granted, you know, uh, spiritual consent is pretty important. Uh, Mark was huge on spiritual consent. And, um, uh, what, what, what did he used to say to you guys, honey? He, he would say, um, I offer for your consideration. Yeah, he always, he used that terminology. I told him that terminology. 
Yeah, is it possible I'll offer for your consideration? That terminology just bugs the crap out of me. You know, because it, it, the first of all, either you got spiritual consent with me or you don't. And I'll tell you real quick if you don't have spiritual consent with me. You know what I mean? Like, like say I'm just talking to somebody, they go, well, I'll offer for your consideration. I go, I don't want your consideration, <laughs> right? I mean, that, that's, that is the truth of the matter. You need to know who you have spiritual consent with. You can't just dart over in a meeting to somebody and tell them how the cow ate the cabbage. I mean, uh, we are, that's a Texas term too. Uh, we, we are the group of people who, man, you come at me too hard, oh, I, I will blow you up. I will not only blow you up, I will never hear what you're telling me. When it says grow in understanding and effectiveness, I've got to do that. Now, I'm not going to patty, you know, cake it, patty coat it, whatever, to get you to hear it. But I doggone sure need to come over there and figure it out if you're open to hear what I got to tell you. It's only the root of our problem. That's, it's very serious, right? So 60 to 63, I think there's a big disservice done in our program where you take the guy, the new guy, the new guy ain't going to get it. I'm telling you, the new guy ain't going to get selfish and self-centered. They really absolutely aren't going to get it. And um, they're going to get it eventually, but if you beat too much into them, they're just, they're just blinded to it. They just need to be separated from alcohol. Right now, that is their biggest problem, is separate me. This obsession to drink is killing me. Now, so sometimes, you know, I'll go through the third step with them, and I'll explain the third step. However, the third step prayer, very powerful, but you're going to have to, in the fourth step, keep taking them back to self-manifested in various ways. Then they start getting the aha right? It's very hard to talk about the third step without really getting into the fourth step because we're getting ready to uncover how self has manifested. It manifests in three ways, right? Resentment, fear, and sex, harms to others. And so in those ways, then we're going to get more down to the, the um, uh, what was uh, uh, affected. How did it affect me? See, I don't even know, I don't even know what self is till you bug me. Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, how many of y'all have ever just sat in a meeting and, and somebody just, heck, they can just bug you sitting there? <laughs> kind of bugging me. And, you know, you know what's really amazing is I, I struggle more with personalities and Alcoholics Anonymous than I do at work or at home. That's kind of sad, isn't it? it? Because here, you know, I'm with the people who were all trying to save each other, and I want to kill just about five of you. And if, if the five of you are gone then I'm okay. You know, when in fact, I, the, as the book says, wait, wait till you hear this one on page 20. This, this was a line I'll never forget when Mark read this at the big book study we were at. I flipped over. I went, that, no way it says that, you know, and I'm, I'm doing, giving it the whole no way while I'm flipping to page 20. And it says, top of the page, our very lives as ex-problem drinkers depends upon our constant thought of others and how we may help meet their needs. Shut up. <laughs> Shut up. I mean, how many of y'all is that your motto? Oh, absolutely. I'm here all about helping others. You know, that, that does not happen until we do this program. I mean, that is just not in my DNA. What's in my DNA is me. How is this going to benefit me? How am I going to get something out of this? What about me? What about me? And what about me? And that's just the way I operate. And so all of a sudden now you take away the booze and I am I am stuck with the root of my problem. And the root of my problem, as it says, starts on page 60. And it says, down at the very bottom, it's, it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to really beat this into me. And here's, once again, like I said, the new guy is really going to start opening his eyes in the four step. The four step is not a confession. As a matter of fact, that just really pisses me off when I see people do it as a confession. It's not a confession. It is an uncovering of our problem. Self, you know, how have I been so self-consumed that I ran over you, blew your arms off, see you laying there flopping, and I'm going, what? What I, what? I didn't do any, I didn't do anything. You know, and everybody's like going, oh my God, we are so blinded to our level of self-centeredness, it's, it's incredible. And if you are truly alcoholic, you got it, Right? 
Say yes. Nod your head. Yes, that you know that you're not going. You know, I don't think she's talking to me. Too bad for her, man. I'm sorry she's got it so bad. But here's the other piece that's so wonderful: is when you are awakened to that level of self-centeredness. Oh man, the magic begins. It really, really does begin. Because see, I'm willing to say I am an outright mental defect. I am full flight from reality. I can't differentiate the truth from the false. You can walk in this room and you can look over at me and go. And I'm like, what was that look for? Now, that person may never have even acknowledged me. I have just completely made that look all about me. Right? And now I'm figuring out, you know, then I'm going to tell Charlie and over and go, see that asshole in the corner? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He gave me that look when he walked in. Yeah. He already doesn't like the fact that I'm a woman. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then the next thing you know, you know, they come up and go, oh my God, man, I so related to what you said. There you have it. See, that's what I'm talking about. That level of delusion is all over me. All over me. Everywhere. So it says in here, it says, page 60 at the bottom, it says the first requirement. Or excuse me, uh, above that, being convinced. Being convinced of what? Being convinced of the A, Bs, and Cs. The problem, the solution, the program of action. If I am not convinced, I can't move forward. Right, And I love Charlie's analogy. I don't know why I never heard this about the car. Is if my car doesn't start and you pull out the jumper cables and it's the alternator, that's that's not going to help it. Or maybe it is. I don't know that much about cars. I, I did try to take auto mechanics, but they kicked me out. You know why? Because I'm a girl. I got some serious girl boy issues. Can you tell? <laughs> And I do, I really do, a lot of old ideas. But, um, so if you jump and pull the jumper cables out, we don't know what the problem is, it's not going to benefit us, right? And that's what that line right there says, being convinced, convinced of what? If you jump me right into the four step, man, I've got no idea that that, that if I don't get down to the, the causes and conditions, the root of my problem, I'm going to drink again. You know why? Because the promises are going to come True in my life. Great things happen to us who get sober, don't they? They really do. I mean, some of you guys still keep making really bad choices. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I mean, you know what I'm talking about. But the majority of us, great things begin to happen. Great things. We get our life back. We start to get our life back. And all of a sudden we go, well, thank God. This is what I needed. When the book talked about willpower... I don't know about you, but willpower is not my problem. Didn't you feel that way? When it said lack of power, I thought, bullshit. I am a strong woman. I left home at 15. I can do anything. Willpower is not my problem. I didn't get that it meant to the drink. When it came to the drink, I had no willpower. But when it talked about the rest, it was like, oh, I can handle it. It, man, as a matter of fact, I'm quite a scrapper. And so all of a sudden I'm thinking when, when, my, when my life starts getting good, I become the victim of the delusion that I can rest satisfaction and happiness if I just manage well. You take away the drink problem. I got it from here. You know, people say, well, I don't let, I don't, you know, God, finances and romances, you know, you know, God doesn't really get in those parts of my life, but he took care of the drink problem. And that's what we're talking about. <clears throat> is that level of agnosticism. Either God's in everything or he's not. And then the book just keeps going into saying that we got to be convinced we are at step three, which is that uh, we turned our will and our life over to the care of God as we understood him. The first requirement, that's pretty damned important when you say it's a, it's a requirement. If I tell you you're going to come work for me and you better show up at eight o'clock, that's a requirement. You start showing up at nine o'clock, we got a problem, right? You haven't even met the first requirement. So it's telling me the first requirement is that I be convinced that any life run on self-will can hardly be a success. I don't know about you, but I don't get what that means. What does self-will look like? 
You know, and like I said, when we're talking about sponsoring the new guy, they they just really need to be removed from the alcohol for a while. And then they begin to get the self-peace. I don't even think we become awakened to the self-peace till about three years. I mean, I don't know if you guys agree with me on that one, but my experience is, is that, that I'm not even really awakened until I am a train wreck, right? I think that a lot of the reason, too, that, that we have such a decline in the years of sobriety is because people don't get the third step. Now, this one really gets people bugged, but I'm stepping out there because Chris is behind me. <laughs> Yeah, I figure, you know, you know, if you're coming to hear Chris, well, then I'll just jump on his coattails. And, um, but I think people go to other 12 step programs because of third step issues. How will that go over? See, I think people tend to go to, uh, uh the Al Anon program, uh, because they've got third step issues because it's control and, and manipulating others. That is our third step, right? Mm -hmm. If you would behave the way I want you to behave, everything would be wonderful. Life would be great. What part of Al-Anon is that for us? No, sir, re Bob. That just happens to be the root of our problem. See, if you guys behave a certain way, I feel secure. That's me playing God. What? How, how many odds do you do? You guys have much luck with everybody behaving the way you want them to. <laughs> Oh, my God. And my, my little plans and designs usually suck pretty bad, right? So it's talking about this, and this is what I think ends up happening in middle-of-the-road AA or meeting-based sobriety since everybody's predominantly bitching. Yes. I mean, isn't that really what you... It sounds like everybody's dumping. It's like a dumping grounds is what open AA has, has, has or, or, or uh, AA meeting tends to sound like today. Tell me if this doesn't sound like that's what it is. It says, <clears throat> on this basis, we're almost always in collision with something or somebody. Doesn't that sound like an open AA or an AA meeting? It's always in collision with something or somebody. They're bitching about traffic. They're bitching about their boss. They're bit and it's like, I mean, that's all a third step issue. We've just removed the alcohol. And now you're really a pain in the neck, you know? And, I mean, have you guys, if you work with one of us that just has had the alcohol removed and we're doing a meeting-based sobriety deal, I mean, are we not just insane walking around? I mean, we'll walk in and the coffee won't be right. We're like, whoa, whoa, huh, what? did nobody make any more coffee? And then you're walking down, you know, hollering down the office and everybody's like, what's going on with Katie, man? And it's like, I don't know. You know, I mean, that is that is self-will run riot. Instead of just looking, going, oh, damn, there's no coffee. I'll make some. <laughs> right? No, sir. They didn't leave me a cup. Me. Where is my coffee? Or the guy who, who stops actually doesn't run the red light. Because if he would have run the red light, I could have run it with him. <laughs> Yeah, and he stopped, the idiot. Oh. God almighty, what was he thinking? <laughs> Clearly he wasn't thinking about me. Uh. I mean, it's all over me. And so when we, uh, when we start to, to uncover this and begin to see this level of self, it's pretty shocking. Now, y'all aren't leaving because of that comment I just made, are you? <laughs> <laughs> um, so... It says, um, you know, and it goes into each person is like the actor who wants to run the whole show. And da, 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 da. one time somebody explained this. And once again, this is what I love about us. We're always in these analogies, you know. And But uh, he said, if you're asked to be in a movie and you're just going to be the person who stands in, right? And they say, we, you know, Katie, I just want you to stand on that mark. And, and the two actors are going to come walking by. And you're just supposed to be reading the paper. Don't move. Don't say Don't nothing. Okay, I can handle that. So I'm sitting there, you know, and I'm and the the, the uh, director says action, you know, and in comes the the movie stars, and, and and all of a sudden I, who am just supposed to be reading the paper, go ho 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 ho, cut cut cut, man, man, and everybody's like, who is who is this person? I'm like, hey, whoa whoa whoa, I'm I'm not I'm thinking they should come in from that other door over there, and you know the lights really aren't working that well, and really the the name of the movie just sucks, you know it really does, I. You know, I need to be the one sharing. And everybody's like going, who is this person? 
See, that's what we do in our everyday life. How many of you guys can walk into a store and figure out how they need to reset the store up <laughs> to better suit you? Absolutely. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, you get the guys in treatment and you tell them, so you guys, you know, if they want to know what their ego looks like when it rebuilds, is all of a sudden they come in with this desperation of a drowning man and within three days they're like going, oh, Jesus, this place has run terrible. You know, they could, the, the green beans suck. They could, they could start that line different where they have two lines coming in and, and they could put, you know, one of us in a, you know what I mean? I mean, they're, they're all about changing it and doing it their way. Right. And, and we do that in everything we do. We really, really do. And, um, at least for me, uh oh. Oh, okay. Yeah. The four people that left said they were very pissed off at you. <laughs> no, I'm not serious. <laughs> they could have, but you know, like I said, man, I, I'm with Chris. It is I am under the cloak as far as I'm concerned. And um, and Charlie and I both know this. We we absolutely love Chris. We admire Chris, and we also know that when you do stand up here and you say things like. People go to the Al-Anon program to try to protect, you know, to think that they're they're getting that part of their program. That's very, I mean, I tell you what, people turn you right off on a CD. Yep. No more. And then they go around talking trash about you. Bastards. <laughs> so, uh, and, and here we are, we're just the ones, we're, we're willing to take the arrows, you know, the, 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 um, the, the book says that we're on the firing line. Sometimes we're getting the arrows from the front. Sometimes we're getting the arrows from our own people. You know what I mean? It is what it is. And, um, but, uh, so then, you know, so this is the actor trying to run the whole show, just trying to organize everything. And, and we all, the, the line I love, and it says it many times in the book, it says, even though our motives are good. See, it tells me right there, I can't even trust my own motives. Well, well, what am I going to do then? I mean, you know what you got to do? You got to live by principle. Principle is the, um, you, come on in. See, four left, four in. That's how that deal works. <laughs> they didn't hear that line, so it's all good. Uh, so you, you got to live by principle. Well, what is principle? Well, spiritual principle is that level of rigorous honesty that, that you know, and that rigorous honesty doesn't mean I'm going to tell you. This is the one that really gets me when somebody comes up and says, you know, I haven't really liked you and I need to come clean with that. No, no, you're still being an ass. You know, that's not the rigorous honesty we're talking about. You need to be rigorously honest with your sponsor about what's going on with you. That's that level of honesty. Then they're going to tell you what you don't want to hear, right? You're, you're prepared to hear it, but you don't want to hear it. I mean, how many of us like the leveling of our pride? Yeah, no, it talks about that all in the book. And so, so that's what I'm talking about, rigorous honesty. Treat someone like you would want to be treated. Um, oh, there's several more. Uh, restitution, go back and clean up your past. You know, uh, constant thought of others. That only comes when we do this work. And so it's, <clears throat> it's going to go into page 61. It's going to give you the toolkit of self-will. So if you are wondering what a motive looks like, it is where it says, um, well, down at the bottom of page 60, before it goes up to 61, I love, it says, if his arrangements would only stay put, tell me how delusional this sounds, if his arrangements would only stay put, if only people would do as Katie wished. The show would be great. Everybody, including Katie, well, she'd be so pleased. How many of y'all know that one? Yeah, yeah when, when, when you come in to talk to somebody, you say, Here, here's, let me show you the problem. It's everybody else, because everybody else is not behaving like I want them to behave, right? So here's the toolkit, and it says, um, he may be kind, considerate, patient, generous, even modest or self-sacrificing. On the other hand, he may be mean, egotistical, selfish, and dishonest. See, I don't even know I have a motive till you don't do what I want you to do. See, my motive is so you'll behave a certain way so I'll get what I need. It's always that. And, and Charlie and I have gone round and round with this one before, but if you had a list 
of, well, I, I, I'm trying not to use my husband as my example because that's kind of mean. Um, but I can't think of an, I can't think of another one, honey. I'm sorry. Um, no, no, it's too tacky. Uh, okay. So it, on a list, I got five things listed. And on the fifth one, it's my kind, being kind. Well, I didn't want to do that because I don't, I don't want to hurt their feelings. That would really hurt their feelings. Doesn't that sound good? It really does sound good. Well, as a sponsor, my job is to make you walk the dog backwards. I want to get to where it's, I want to hear what number one and number two is. Because number one and number two is so that you'll be okay. If they'll behave the way you want them to behave, it's so you'll be okay. I got to use you, honey. I'm sorry. Okay. So, because I can't come up with anything and I don't know if I'm getting my point across. I have known my husband for 25 years. We were best friends for 20 of those years, 18. And I, I saw him go through series of marriages. Series of marriages. And, uh, oh, my God, he'd always come to me and he'd go, Katie, you know, blah, 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 blah. and I'd think, oh, honey, you know, I, well, I wasn't honey then, but it's like, oh, Charlie, you know, you just, you, 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 you pick pretty women and they're all crazy. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, they're pretty, but God dang, man, you are, you, your detection on, on crazy is big. And, uh, and so, you know, he, so yeah, then he, then he, he, he found a woman that, that wasn't that attractive, but had a lot of other things to offer. And then they got together and, and I kept thinking that this is not the gale for him. What is he doing? And I told him, he said, um, after they got together, he said, I just didn't want to, I didn't want to leave her because I didn't want to hurt her feelings. And I thought, oh, that sounds good, doesn't it? That's like fifth on the list. But the truth is you didn't want to leave because you enjoyed that relationship of distance and being able to enjoy the things in life that, that had to offer. And it was about fifth on the list. But that's the same thing. I'm sorry to use that example. I didn't know you were going to use that one. I know. That was... <laughs> I swear, nothing was coming to mind about me. Can you believe that? <laughs> I know, but, but the truth is, is it's so easy to see in others, isn't it? Selfishness is so much easier to see in you than in me, right? And that's what we do. We become aware of selfish and self-centered in others way quicker than we do in ourselves. Right? I mean, two people in an AA meeting are in a heavy conversation. One of them might be crying, and somebody comes up and goes, Hey, hey, what are you doing? And like, oh my God, did you not see this intense conversation going on? I just, I just wanted to say hi. Like, Could you be any more self centered? Do you see what I'm saying? I mean, it's, it's all over us. Okay, okay. Well, but. I know, I thought about that too. Because I do know all these ex-wives very well. And it, there's never anything worse than it being on CD. You know what I mean? It's like, oh yeah, you're stuck like Chuck, man. But, um, oh yeah, we all, we all are very well of the, the old CD coming back to bite you in the butt. Um, but that's, that's what I'm talking about is this, it, it, even when trying to be kind, so any time that I'm going to filter my uh, my self-centeredness is always filtered through my motives, right? And that's how I usually know I've got it. And so I can't even trust my motives. That's just the way self-centeredness works. So it tells us what usually happens. The show doesn't come off very well. Now, Katie begins to think that life doesn't treat her very well. She decides to exert herself more. She becomes, on the next occasion, still more demanding or gracious because, see, I'm a chameleon. I walk in somewhere and I am scamming. How many of y'all know what I'm talking about? Oh, yeah. I am scamming. I mean, this is what I do. At a, at, when we all go out to dinner in an AA event, I don't know about you guys, but there are certain people in AA that bug me. Yeah? I'm in the right room with people. And, and if you look like somebody who's going to stick a tentacle in my neck and suck the life out of me, I am... I am not, oh yeah, oh, I'll say it out loud, even though you won't, and, and, and we'll, we're all going to dinner, I will make sure I am not going to sit next to you. How many of y'all know that feeling when you walk in a room and you're going, okay, we're all getting ready to sit down, and who am I going to, 
right? And see, I mean, I'm constantly working the deal, so I'm more demanding and more gracious wherever I need to be. You know, that's how I do. I'm the chameleon because I got to get what I need, period. It's always looking out for Katie. When we talk about how self-centered this disease is, oh my God, you guys. I mean, once again, I go back to women and children. We will lose our children behind the drink. You see the level of self-centeredness. Now, we're driven by this, this genetic bullet, yeah. But I mean to tell you, that is, that's a heartbreak. You can't drink enough booze to take care of that pain. And so it says, it says, still the play doesn't suit her, admitting she might be somewhat at fault. Now, this is a line in AA that really makes me crazy. And here it is, my part. Well, I'm going to look at my part. Well, uh, here, here's my part. Here's, here's the part that, here's my part, and here's your part. I'm going I'm to look at my part. Are you all with me on that? The book never says my part. It says we disregard the other man completely. This was my inventory, not theirs. Unless it's Ron and I'll take his inventory all day long. But other than that, <laughs> uh-huh. And so, uh, so what we've got here is it tells me right there, it says, uh, admitting she may be somewhat at fault, she is sure others are more to blame. That's as far as most of us ever got. Justifiable anger. What is that? Justifiable anger is my ego is going to get revenge period. It talks about the victor only seems to win at war. You know why that is? How many of you guys are right? Yeah, thank you. Me too. Oh, I'm right. There are, there are occasions I am right. But how good does that feel? You got the whole world just a bloodbath below you. you go, but I am right. It never feels good. And the longer you're sober and the more spiritual you grow and are awakened, it feels even worse to win. It really does. It's much better to take the high road. Once again, it's not in my DNA to take the high road. I always have a motive unless I'm working these steps when I'm taking the high road. I've got to be working these steps and I can take the high road because that's the spiritual path. I'm going about three more minutes and we're going into questions. And then here it says, it says he becomes angry, indignant, and self pity Okay, that is that is pretty much carbon copy. I am pissed off, indignant for all I've done for you. I can't believe you're treating me this way. And self-pity is nobody gets me. My whole life is like this. I mean, is that not how you guys play the whole deal out? I am angry, kicking and screaming, and for everything I've done for you, I can't believe it. <sighs> this is my life. I mean, that's how it always plays out. This is, this is good sponsorship when you're being able to point this out to somebody. And then here's what I think is the basic trouble. Is he really not a self-seeker even when trying to be kind? See, once again, the book tells me I can't wish it away or think it away. My, I can't work on my defects. That's another thing you hear people say. Yep, yeah, uh, we're talking about the four steps. Oh, okay. Uh, you know, they, what, 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 oh, I'm working on my defects. What does that mean? Is self-fixing self? I mean, we would like for you not to blurt out and be publicly rude. You know, I mean, there are some things we like you to contain. But when you're talking about this level of selfish and self-centeredness, self-righteous, self-pity, spiritual pride, call it whatever you, it is you got, you don't get to work on it. Otherwise, why do we have a sixth step? Right? Why don't you just remove them yourself? I mean, it doesn't work that way. We have to have God remove these character defects. We had moral and philosophical convictions galore, but we couldn't live up to them no matter how hard we tried. How many of you guys know that one? How about that when you start breaking all your moral uh, code sober? That's ugly, isn't it? Yeah, that's the one where you hope nobody sees you doing any of that stuff. That's all wrong, 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 wrong. Doesn't matter right? Your values are your values. My values are my values. 
And so it talks, in a, and, and uh, I'm going to get into the root of the problem. I mean, we're talking about the different ways itself is manifesting. It's telling me right there I'm trying to run the whole show. And it says here, it says selfish and self-centered. That we think is the root of our trouble. It says it's driven by a hundred forms of fear. So, guys, fear is not my the root of my problem, is it? Now, that, that one's a dandy because everybody's trying to manage fear. Everybody wants to do this massive fear inventory. I say you start a fear tsunami doing that, baby man. The last thing, yeah, the truth of the matter is, is fear is a natural human reaction, right? I need to know fear. If the house is on fire, I need to get the hell out, right? If I haven't paid the IRS in five years and I get a letter from the IRS, I can't even open it because fear has paralyzed me. That's a problem. But see, fear is not the root of my problem. It's what I'm driven by. So you're not going to get rid of fear. Fear is, is, is a God-given, it's a good thing. I need to know who is safe in this room and who is not, right? I've got that instinctual fear, but it's when it drives me is where it's a problem. And when it drives me, it goes to delusion, not denial. The book never talks about denial. It talks about delusion, which means I believe a lie. If you go back out and drink, after we've explained the disease of alcoholism to you and the problem, is that, po is that possible? Absolutely. You're delusional. You think that you can remain sober on the knowledge alone. That is what a delusion is, right? The knowledge is not going to help you. The fear drives you into the delusion. Then it goes into self-seeking. you got to go tell 10 people. you got to try to get the right answer out of everybody. How many of y'all know that one? I'm going to call four people till somebody gives me the right answer. You know? And, and you can get plenty of people in AA to co-sign your bullshit. Yes, right? Should I be in a relationship with this crazy chick? No, 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 yes. Good, yes. Talk to me. Talk to me. Yeah. And it goes both ways, trust me. Uh, and so it says, our pro so our problem is, we think we're, uh, so our problems are, are of our own making. That is a promise. Isn't that a wonderful promise? Because see, if, if my problems are of my own making, then I got a solution. If my problems, if you're the problem, I got no solution. Because you have to change in order for me to be okay. I don't have any luck in that, man. Well, actually I do. Charlie's changed quite a bit, but, uh, <laughs> um, we won't go there. Uh, so, but here's the deal, guys, is, you know, it, it says, am I not really a producer of confusion rather than harmony? Another very powerful line in the third step. Because the truth is, is I'm over here trying to orchestrate something, and I got so much confusion going on because I was orchestrating, right? And then I'm going to tie this whole deal up, when, which is the crux of the deal. You know in the book where it says God does not make too hard a terms for those who seek him? I love what Chris said. We don't need to make this deal. It, it's not difficult. Either my problems are of my own making or they're not. How difficult is that? Right? I call my sponsor because I'm mad. She's going to tell me, where did I set the ball rolling? Where did I place my posi myself in a position to be hurt? Where did I make a decision based on self? Right? That's what I'm going for. It's like, Marty, get to the point. Come on, don't soft sell it. Just tell me, what did I do? You know, because I don't see it. I'm blinded to it. And it says, God does not make too hard terms for those who seek him. Here's the terms. Oh, which, by the way, they gave me that note. Um, and so uh, the terms are down the last paragraph on the bottom. It says, this is the how and why of it. First of all, we have to quit playing God. Well, I don't know about you guys. I can't quit playing God. Can you? Hell no. I can't quit playing God. That's all I know to do is to orchestrate, man. I got to get the job. I got to get the car. I got to pay the bills. I got to show up. I got to take care of these kids, man. I got to run the show. It's all I know to do. Well, it tells me I got to quit playing God. Okay, well, I, I really don't know how to do that. I'm willing to look at that. So it comes up to the top of 63. When we sincerely took such a position, what is that? That I'm going to quit playing God. Now, I'm a little scared behind that because I really don't know what that looks like. It says all sorts of remarkable things followed. We had a new employer being all powerful. He provided what we needed under two terms. Here's the term. So when the book says God does not make too hard terms for those who seek him, here are our terms. It says we keep close to him and perform his work well. He takes care of all the problems. 
So you're telling me, if I keep close to him, which means I got to get unblocked, so that sunlight of the spirit, because this is where God is. God is not out here, right? Or your your you know whatever power you got, it's in here. I got to get unblocked so that I can get this sunlight of the spirit. So I get this intuitive notion. So I understand how to intuitively handle situations that used to baffle me. Placed in a position of neutrality, all these promises that are getting ready to come true in my life, right? And that I don't have to run the show. I'm not driven by the fear to make me have to get you people to behave a certain way. Is that I get unblocked. I live in the disciplines of 10 and 11, right? So I get unblocked, live in the disciplines, and then help his children. He'll take care of everything. You mean he'll take care of my mortgage payment? He'll take care of this? Well, of course you got to show up for work. I mean, how stupid is that? You know what I mean? Of course you got to go look for the job. I mean, how stupid is that when we really say, oh, you know, I need to run the show? No, I'm talking about everything. You just got to get out of bed. You got to do the next right thing, right? I mean, I know that's a slogan, but it's a damn good one. And so what you got to do is you got to, you got to stay close to him and perform his work well. And if all you do is the disciplines of 10 and 11 and you never really continue doing the, the house cleaning and the restitution, you've missed a big piece of the work. You know, so when, when I have sponsees that are having problems, I'm always going back to the ninth step. How many, how many unfinished amends do you still have? I mean, we always read the ninth step promises, don't we? Yeah, the ninth step promises are so powerful. And we're always reading the ninth step promises, but how many of us have really made restitution to all people we have harmed? Oh, I got the ones off my butt, you know, the ones that I were major, but not to all persons I had harmed. And so that's what we're talking about. We've got to keep this deal. And then it goes into um, all of the promises into which we were, you know, the, the third step talks about. However, once again, when we're getting ready to go into the fourth step, it says next we launch out on, on this rigorous course of action. And it says even though our, our uh, uh, decision was a vital and crucial step, what decision? The third step. See, the third step is still a decision, but it's a darn important one to break down to the guy so that they can understand it. Okay, so now we're going to take about 10 minutes, maybe yeah, about 10 minutes to ask questions. Uh, it's ready. He just gave me the phone. No, questions, good. questions, yeah. And so uh, so what we're going to do, guys, is um, answer your questions. Thanks. we got questions specifically for the first three steps. We're going to do them for the rest of the steps, too, but we, we could get way out there. Anybody specifically first? <laughs> <laughs> but Bill Wilson, and y'all can take a shot at it, too, but, but, was, but I, we get asked this question a whole lot. The question was, and there's a story in there, and he's talking about staying sober 24 hours at a time. It's a parlor trick. If you need the parlor trick to stay sober, rock on, have a great life. Bill Wilson, in the textbook, in the program part of the, of the book, first up to 164 pages, explains that this is permanent and for keeps. We live life a day at a time. You with us? I, I, I'm not living off a spiritual experience I had 22 years ago. I'm living off a cool experience I had last night at dinner talking to some brothers and sisters in this fellowship here. Y'all, 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 yeah. this, this idea that I wake up every day and decide to stay sober is where we turn the corner from a spiritual program to a self-help program. And I got to tell you, you can find a lot of stuff in these stories, everybody doing their own little versions, their own little thought, even from the co-founders. You follow? I'm not saying that that's not in the literature, but it's not in the basic 164 pages. It's crystal clear. This is for keeps. Is that, y'all, y'all understand where we're at? If, if you need a parlor trick, I just have to do this today. I just have to do this today. You're in a spot where you can't imagine living life without alcohol or drugs. And so you're just, you know, to, to get them to come on, you know, let's, let's just do it today. Then that's fine. Early on in sobriety, I think it's a great way to do it, to help, help a little guy get his feet on the ground. But if you're doing this on a long-term basis, you're, you're destined to fail because of what the rest of the 12 steps tell us, what the rest of the, the program tells us. You follow? I have a daily reprieve based on the maintenance of my spiritual condition. Daily, that means every day. It's completely different with I stay sober one day at a time. Y'all understand where we're at with this? I don't. I want to take it away from 
the, the, the misunderstanding around one day at a time is, is, that, is that we are somehow keeping ourselves sober one day at a time. Make sense? God gives us our bread, our daily bread, as the old prayer goes. Y'all, y'all follow that one? So I wouldn't have ever objected to one day at a time if it hadn't swung so completely over to this idea that every day is a day that I can choose to stay sober. You, you follow? What happens to the guy that relapses? He chose to... Come on, I'm going to go back real quick. Katie's given this example. I've got a good friend of mine in, in, uh, in uh, the Hill Country that's in, in trouble with her kids, and Child Protective Services has been called. You with this? And she, all she had to do to keep her kid was stay sober, and she drank again. So you're going to tell me she chose to drink? She Absolutely not. She chose not to do some things that the book has outlined to keep us spiritually connected one day at a time. You'll see the connection? You don't want to add to that? You all good? What else? Another question? I, uh, this was one of those moments where the question was, how do I know if I'm, if I'm, if I'm aware that I'm in self-will and that selfishness is self centered how do I know if I'm doing God's will? This was one of those instances where I was sponsoring a guy, and he asked me that. It's a very common question, you know, because everybody always wants to go, well, how do I know what God's will is for me? And that was the question. And I heard coming out of my mouth one day, my mouth said, well, you know what? I don't always know what God's will is for sure, but I'm pretty sure of what it isn't. And if we just start, I said, why don't we just start off focusing on not doing what's clearly not God's will? You know, it's like the guy that's going to carve a statue of an elephant, and he just cuts off everything that doesn't look like an elephant. But, I mean, it's like that in God's will. If I can just, I think a drunk like me can stay real busy just not doing what doesn't feel right. And what, what I can tell, you know, is, is where I'm ha- If I'm having to ask nine people to get my answer, like Katie was talking about, I was in a meeting one time where I, I said, well, you know, I got this problem. I got this thing, you know, and, and I'm really, I've been talking about it. And I talked to this one guy about it, and he said this, and I talked to another guy about it, and I talked to my sponsor about it, and this old cowboy named Sonny was chairing the meeting, and he goes, you know, your sponsor may or may not know the answer to that question. And I was like, okay. And he goes, but I think you do. And it just sucked all the air out of the room, you know, because I had to go, well, of course I know the answer, but I want to talk about it some more, you know, until I get to do what I want. So I think in that still quiet place, we can we can get an idea of what, what's God's will. And, you know, and what we're saying about this thing about the self piece is so big and it's been so missed in so much of the fellowship because I think one of the biggest problems we have today is taking a guy from you got a problem do you believe there's a power and taking him right and popping him down and doing the third step prayer that was my experience the first time through the steps and i missed that self piece for a long long time because if you pop me right from are you willing to believe to the third step prayer i miss the root of my problem and i start working a program based on just not drinking so this self piece, you can't read pages 60 to 63 too many times. I mean, Katie started feeling like her sponsor had only read three pages out of the book. You know, every time she'd call her, you know, you're taking me back to, you know, I mean, what am I doing? So, uh, any, any, uh, are we out of time or any other questions? I don't, you know, in the que- I've never really addressed that. You know, and when you say the question in, in, when it, in the third step prayer, when it says, relieve me of the bondage of self, um, I've never really done a lot of differentiating the truth, the difference between me and self, other than, you know, I'll tell you for a long time that when I didn't have somebody, Mark was the first one to really break down the, what the bondage of self looked like to me. There were times when I did the third step prayer where it just sounded like a bunch of churchy talk. You know, I mean, when you go relieve, if you don't, if I haven't been marched through pages 60 to 63, I got no idea what the third step prayer is talking about. You know, when it says relieve me of the bondage of self. I mean, am I the only one that sat around going, what does that mean? You know, and and then, but when you break it down like Katie did, all of a sudden I go, Oh, so I am operating so much under self, you know, that I just, that it's, it's driving everything in my life. I, you know, I haven't really spent a lot of time on that one. Eckhart totally does some stuff with that and, you know, where he talks about the between I and me and I can't stand myself and that sort of thing, which, you know, implies that there's an I and a, you know, and a myself, but I've never had that come up really. I, 
I'm gonna let Chris take this one. I just I, when when I say though that the qualifying a new guy is a is a dicey topic. Part of the weak part of that equation is that we're dependent on the the new man to make the diagnosis. And, and like and Katie talks about how a lot of times when she got here, she didn't think she was alcoholic because if you get these outside issues off of me, I'll handle the alcohol. And you know, and it wasn't until she'd been around a little while. So, but. Um, so it, it's 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 a, it's a dicey topic, and uh, I'm, I'm, that's why I'm gonna let Chris have it. <laughs> Did y'all hear the question? Y'all are the, the the question boils down to our basic uh, job in Alcoholics Anonymous and all the twelve step fellowships is this qualifying business. I've done it. We can all sit here and say kumbaya, and if you think you're an alcoholic, you're probably an alcoholic, and we love you, and let's go to dinner, and let's have you with it, and that's that's all great and good. But that's not what the big book is telling me to do. The big book is, is asking me, because I have a story, I'm armed with the facts about myself, to help you see if, you, if you're if you in this in this same situation I am. Because if you are, then I can help you. And I guarantee you, there's some people in this room right now that are, cons- that are sober long periods of time that are still questioning whether they're alcoholic or addict or not. And, and they're, they're also the ones that are using that as an excuse for not sponsoring anybody. I don't worry about the little guy that squeaks in under the wire uh, I may or may not be, but I'm going to stay anyway. Rock on, you're welcome. I worry about the people that might get tangled up with him in sponsorship situation downstream who will not know their truth. Folks, i got to say this real quick. I'm going to emphasize this by taking my coat off. (laughs) And rolling up my sleeve. This is life and death. There is no other solution out there for alcoholism. None. We have a a solution. But unless this person is convinced, they're not going to do this solution because of what we've been talking about. About the time we get ready to do this little third step prayer, they'll come along with us. And then they're going to do, and then we launch down a course of vigorous action and we're going to start talking about a fourth step and they're going to crap out. They're going to st- sit there and mess with this for nine months or never start it at all. You follow? Sit around meetings, end up relapsing, perhaps, perhaps not. But in, in, in the long run, it'll be our fault that they didn't get sober. AA, I tried AA, it didn't work. Y'all follow what we're saying? We don't want to kick anybody. But I'm never going to look at this guy. He has a doubt. I said, buddy, maybe, you, maybe you're not. If you don't have the phenomenal craving plus the mental obsession, then you're, the, my book says you're not one of us. I, maybe you just need some therapy. Maybe you need, maybe you need a, 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 a date. God damn, I don't know what the, t- <laughs> a good leeching. You know, I don't know. I don't know what the, t- I don't know what to tell you, but, but, uh, but we're not here to make everybody comfortable. And that's the biggest problem that we have. But we've got this big social deal. Everybody's welcome. And they are. But this is life and death situation. And I have a responsibility to make sure you hear the truth. as out, Not my truth. Not Chris Raymer's truth. Not my hospital's truth. Treatments at whatever. The book, the book. What was the message that Bill and Dr. Bob gave us 75 years ago? That's, the, that's what we're supposed to do. I mean, it's, it, it amazes me. The first time I, I saw somebody get upset in a meeting, we were talking about this, and this lady was just shaking. I'm an alcoholic. If I say I'm an alcoholic, because she couldn't identify with the symptoms that we were talking about. Y'all, y'all understand? Oh, oh my, and of course, everybody crumbled like a deck of cards around this. Got to talk to the lady for a few minutes, and she said, she said listen, I came to Alcoholics Anonymous because I couldn't sleep. That's why I drank. <laughs> Let me, let me see if I can get this. Let me get this right here. You couldn't sleep, and that's why you drank. That's right. And then when I came to AA, I got hooked up with a doctor, and they gave me some sleep medications, and now I sleep great, and I don't drink anymore. Okay? True story. You with me? Connect, connect the dot. Okay, okay. So you're taking the medication. That's fixed the problem. So you don't need a spiritual experience. You didn't need to work this. You, you follow? Can you imagine? I've been sober 13 years. I'm thinking... God, can you imagine how she sponsors? Oh my God, I just can't. I'm so glad you're here. I've got this greatest doctor in here. I bet you're having trouble sleeping, aren't you? Oh my God, I know exactly what we can do. You know what I'm saying? And we're going to go get you an appointment with this doctor. We're going to get you on some of that Lenesta and everything's just going to be okay. Come on, let's go. Oh my God, you follow? But whose fault is it? It's, it's our fault as a fellowship because we continue to allow it to happen. You with us? Not kicking her out, but somebody needs to stand up and say, excuse me. 
this is not the message out of the big book. You follow? Everybody gets uncomfortable about that. But the truth of the matter is, we have a responsibility. You're, you're free to agree or disagree. Did that answer your question? Troublemaker? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Any other quick one? We got, we're going to go, talk about it more on the 12-step stuff we're going to do this afternoon. Taking people on to raise talks about uh, uh, taking people on to raise. If I'm sponsoring this guy, my job is to get you through the steps. You follow? Quick allow you to have a spiritual experience and then I'm going to hold you accountable after that. I'm, we're going to periodically check in. You're going to do 10 step stuff with me. I'm going to make sure you're okay. I'm going to watch you in meetings and you're going to keep me in check and I'm going to keep you in check. You follow? But I don't take you on to raise means that I don't take, I'm not, as your sponsor, you can't date for a year. I mean, I hear that nonsense. How many of you guys have heard that nonsense? You know, nowhere in the book does it say you can't date for a year. That's ridiculous. It's got nothing, it's what makes People think AA is a cult, you know, because we're autotron, we're controlling people. But but that's where they, uh, some treatment center said that or some therapist said that. Y'all, you follow what I'm saying? I don't care who you date. I don't care where you work. I don't care, I don't, I don't care what you do out there. I'm not taking you on to raise. If you want some, some, some guidance of some experience that I might have had, I'll be glad to share that with you. How many, again, we're going to talk about it this afternoon. How many people do we sponsor? I heard a guy when I was at, uh, up in, um, uh, uh, Louisiana, not long ago, and the guy says, if you're sponsoring more than two people, your, your ego's out of whack. <laughs> wow. I sponsor 30. I, 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 I'm, I'm wondering, because I don't sponsor the same way he does. He takes them on to raise. You with us? Like you would raise a child. Like you would raise a child. Oh, that's he didn't understand. Yeah. <laughs> Oh my God! I, I, we thought, I thought we were speaking English here. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Yeah. No, but I just I got people. I have my people call me every day. You know, three or four times a day, call me. I just don't do that. You know, God's in charge. God tells you what to do. You know, little brother asked a question a minute ago. You know, our 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 spirits won't stay awakened. We become attuned to what's going on. And truly, what Katie says is, we know right from wrong. You don't have to come and ask me what shirt to wear. Good God. <laughs> The blue one. There you go. It's okay. It's just, it's just, it's just, another one. We had a quick one. You can give. I know, but you, you can you can you can add into this. Let me, let me. I said something last night. I'm gonna repeat. There's a lot of people. They come in the treatment and or wherever they go, come into our AA meeting and they're dropping. And it's just I know. Before you can get a word in edgewise, they say I know I'm an alcoholic. You with us? And then you say, did you work the steps? And they say, no, I didn't. So then you don't know you're an alcoholic. You with us? It's like saying, I know I have cancer, but I'm not going to mess with that chemo stuff. It's like maybe you're not convinced that you're really sick. Because once you're convinced, you'll do whatever you're going to need to do to save your ass. And it's, it's uncomfortable and as painful as it is. But I think it's a perfect analogy. People come to meetings and they say, I know I'm an alcoholic, but they don't sponsor anybody. It's like it was not placed to you as an option in the book, the book said we. Charlie read it last night, or, or Katie. It's imperative to work with others if we're going to stay sober. You, you follow. Most of these guys, they 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 know they're an alcoholic, but they truly, deep down inside, if you talk to them, there's that lurking notion that the book talks about that their case is just a little bit different. You don't understand. My case is a little bit different. I don't have to do what you guys have got to do. Make sense. And so they relapse again and again. This is, again, can, can be stopped if we'll stop them at the door and qualify the, the bejesus out of them. Really help them. Charlie said it. Give them a case of alcoholism at the, at the door, then we don't have to worry about it. Yeah. I, I, just wanted, I just wanted to address that one thing about the difference between being a life coach and being a sponsor. Because when we, we always tie that life coach thing to... Um, uh, and, and now the only thing that is good about being a life coach is you get paid to be a life coach. You know, uh, sponsorship doesn't pay. But um, I've known some guys that are paying for life coaches, and it just—it's unbelievable to me. But I mean, I, I, uh, but the beauty of being able to put somebody through the clear-cut directions out of the big book is that when you can get somebody through this work promptly and get them in touch with the power 
then you don't have to make every decision for them. And if you, and if, and on the other hand, until you get that guy through the work and in touch with the power, they will wear you out. I mean, you know, that's why you can't sponsor more than two of them is, you know, is if they're going, you know, what kind of answer machine do I want to buy? You know, I looked at the one and it's $89 and the other one's $129 and this, you know, and you're just, you know, it's like, you know, I don't, I don't know what job you should have or who you should date or what you should have, but God, I can get you in touch with the power, and I guarantee you God knows where you need to work and who you need to go out with and that sort of thing. So that's why we're about getting somebody through this process and in touch with the work, and that way they're not calling me going, what color socks do I wear today or, you know, and that sort of thing. But, you know, because, you know, so does that make sense when we talk about taking them on to raise, you know, and that sort of thing? I just, all right. And, you know, and I, and I think that's why you can't sponsor a, a pack of those guys. But when they're calling you up and you're going, okay, where'd you make a decision based on self? You know, what'd you do? You know, what's your part? And I don't want to hear about her. You know, if I got a sponsor and I'm calling up and I call to gripe about Katie and he says, starts talking about Katie, I'm dead. I got to have somebody that's taken me back to what was your part in it. Where'd you make a decision based on self that place you in the position to you know be harmed? What you know where you know what's your delusion? Where's your self will and that sort of thing? So um, I think it's time for lunch. So uh, thanks a lot, everybody. You know, thanks. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.